old city. So, um, <clears throat> and, and they, Gerald has never let us live that down. It's been 15 years, so here it is. All right, I'm going to introduce the uh, next preacher, but before I do, you know, yesterday in my uh, preaching, I just sort of made a statement about Israel, and you um, overwhelmingly, hey, is it still open? And I'm, I'm leaving in like, you know, three and a half weeks. So I just text um, the company I've been going with for the last, well, 35 years, and ask them, just it was a, just a long shot, is May 16 through 25, 2018 open? And they said yes. Now, what I'll do within the next 30 days, all of you that brought your group, we've got a good number of your names that are in here, but those of you that actually brought the group, we do have your information for you signed up. And we will just send you a confirmation, and then if you're interested, we'll go from there. But what I attempt, I'm going to attempt to do, never done it, is lead a Jubilee um, Israel tour. So there's between here and the other two places that we travel. So if you decide you want to go, it'll be good. And um, one thing about it, there's some of you, the couple days I spend with you is not enough to straighten your hide out. I need longer. And I... Uh, well, anyway, and, uh, one, one last, last story. We were there on one trip a while back, and while we were there, uh, a gentleman lost his wife. His wife died in the Holy Lands. And so the question was, uh, do you bury her there or ship her back? And he was looking at burying her there, but he found out that one person they buried there came back to life, so he decided to ship her. So anyway, um, <clears throat> isn't that terrible? That is so bad, so bad, so bad. But one, one of the things we do and will always do is we will use Bible preachers. We'll never have, as long as I, I'm alive and they let me have any say-so as to who speaks, will it be anyone other than a Bible preacher? And then I really like someone that's passionate about preaching the Word. Uh, they say in the old days when the preachers preach, you couldn't tell if they were preaching or fighting bees. So they, they got after it. And, uh, and the message is something to get after. It's an eternal message, and it's a message of hope. And so for that, we're grateful. Herb Revis is pastor of uh, North Jacksonville Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. You can catch him on the radio down in that area. He's been at Woodstock, gosh, so many times through the years. And he's been helping us in Jubilee. Many of you probably heard him last week in Singing in the Sun, a lot of different platforms, but he's one of my absolute favorites. Would you give a warm welcome to Dr. Herb Revis? Amen. Well, it's wonderful to be here. I know it's the last session. I want to assure you, well, I'll just tell you what Taylor Swift told her, uh, I'll tell you what she told her last boyfriend. I won't keep you long, all right? So that's, uh, I want you to know you're, it's going to be okay. You know, as senior adults, there's always something to learn, isn't it? You can always take it up a notch. We never arrive. I was thinking about the senior adult couple. They were sitting out on their porch in the porch swing, and she was at one end of the swing, and he was at the other end of the swing, and they were just out there swinging. And it was a hot summer evening, and she said to him, she said to her husband, she said, do you remember when... Uh, you were dating me, and you'd come by the house, and we'd sit in a swing like this, and you'd sit close to me. She said, scoot over here close to me. So he scooted over there close to her, and they swang, swinging a little more. And then she said, don't you remember when we were uh, dating? We'd sit out in a swing like this, and you'd put your arm around me. Put your arm around me. So he put his arm around her, and they just kept swinging. And she said, you remember when we used to sit out and swing like this and we were dating? You'd sit up close, put your arm around me. And then she said, you'd sort of reach over and begin to nibble on my earlobe. Well, he just jumped off of the swing and took off into the house. She said, where are you going? He said, to get my teeth. So anyway, you can always take it to the next level. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to read from God's Word from the book of the Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to begin to read in verse 9. For a few minutes this morning, I want to preach on this subject, the kind of church that God attends. The kind of church that God attends. From the book of Revelation chapter 1, and I'll begin to read in verse 9. The Bible says, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos, 
for the Word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to his feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels, the messengers, the pastors of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. God, put your words in my mouth, your thoughts in my mind. God, give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us. May we never be the same because of these moments around your word. I confess Jesus is on the throne and the devil is a defeated foe. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. I am from that great, grand, glorious state of Texas, wherever molehills and mountain, never dry creeks or river, and wherever man's a liar. And I want to tell you a, a story that happened way out there. Uh, it's about an old-fashioned cowboy who came in off the ranch to go to church for the first time. He was going to go to the downtown sort of hike a fluting church. He had, he had never been there before. He arrived at the church, and he took off his old sweat-stained cowboy hat. He was wearing his denim shirt, only had one, but it was clean, worn-out jeans, but they were clean. His old beat-up boots, but they were scuffed but clean. He walked into that big fancy-pants church. He was amazed. The women were clothed in minks, dripping in diamonds, and the men were all wearing these fancy suits. When he sat down, all the people on the pew sort of moved away from him like he had a contagious disease. And when the service was over, the pastor approached him and said, why don't you pray and ask God what you ought to wear when you come to our church? He didn't know he was being insulted. He's just a, just a kind-hearted cowboy. And, and so he said, sir, I will. Well, the next Sunday rolled around. He, he came back to church. He he walked in, and as the pastor looked, he couldn't believe it. Got the same cowboy hat in his hand, same worn-out shirt, same worn-out jeans, same worn-out boots. And the pastor, after the sermon, confronted him and said, I thought I told you to pray and ask God what you ought to wear when you come to this church. And the cowboy said, well, I did, pastor, but God said he had no idea because he had never once set foot in your church. You know, today we pastors are under tremendous pressure about the way we are going to reach the millennial generation, and we got the senior adults, and they got their idea church, and we got the median adults and the single adults, and we've got the students, and we've got the widows, and we've got the young marrieds and the nearly marrieds and those who wish they wasn't married. I mean, we got, we got all these people in the church, and everybody's got an idea, but I just want to explain to you something. The, the idea should be this. This ought to be the driving force in our life. It's not the kind of church that pleases me and not not the kind of church that pleases God. It's all about the kind, of, uh, the kind of church that pleases you, the kind of church that pleases me. It's all about the kind of church that pleases God because if God doesn't show up, you can't have church. Do you understand that this morning? You just can't have church. So I want to show you from the Word of God the kind of church that pleases God. First of all, the kind of church God attends is a church that produces a dynamic Christian, a dynamic Christian. Now, we're living in a day and age where people have a consumer mentality and they visit your church and they fill out a card and they want you to come and see them and you sit down and you begin to talk and they ask you questions like this, what does your church have to offer me? 
And what I'm saying now to people, that's not the issue. The issue is not what does this church have to offer you. The issue is what do you have to offer Jesus Christ through the ministry of this local church. That's the issue. The Apostle John is a tremendous example of a dynamic Christian. The rough, rugged, strong believer that was produced by the first century church. We've got all of these folks that are in and out. They're up and down. They can't take much preaching. I mean, they get offended at the announcements. They never make it to the sermon. I mean, they, they're so uptight, and they get, they get so mad, and they get so angry, and they're so torn up because somebody moved a piece of furniture. Somebody asked them, hello, to move to a, another Sunday school room to maximize the potential of the facilities. They're upset because their favorite flavor of coffee is not being offered. They don't like the way the parking lot's been striped, and they sang a song Sunday that they had never heard before, and the preacher sort of got to meddling with them. Does anybody understand what, is any, is anybody understand what I'm talking about today? I'm talking namby, pamby, loosey-goosey. We got folks who wouldn't know God Almighty if they got hemmed up with him in a broom closet and he hit them over the head of the Bible as big as a ping-pong table. All they've got is religion and they come to church and they just want to suck the life out of it. But Jesus still says, I'm calling people out of this generation to deny yourself to take up your cross and to follow me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. What we need are some people who love Jesus Christ with tremendous passion that are 100% sold out, pedal to the metal, whole hog, I mean wide open for the glory of God. Amen? You know, if we're going to have this kind of Christian, there's some truths we need to recover in the church. For instance, we need to recover the truth that p pressure produces Christian maturity. Pressure produces Christian maturity. He spoke there. He says, I'm your brother in tribulation. And that word tribulation he used there speaks of pressure that will crush you. It's a crushing pressure. And many of you are going through a tremendous time of pressure. Grief. You're walking through a valley with grief so strong that it's crushing you. You found out a diagnosis from a doctor, and it's, it's a diagnosis that's caused you such anxiety, it's crushing you. There's stuff going on in your church, in your ministry, that you can't sleep at night. The pressure is crushing you. You've got a teenage grandchild away from God. You, you, you can't stand the thoughts of the direction they're going. You've got adult children. You just found out some stuff that's going on in their life, and it's overwhelming. And when I first got saved, I thought maybe somehow Christianity would allow you to escape pressure and heartache, anxiety and difficulty. But I found that when you get saved that the Lord Jesus Christ actually uses those things like heavenly sandpaper to polish you into the mature believer that he wants you to be. A great preacher friend of mine has said for years, anything that drives you to the sufficiency of Jesus Christ is not your enemy, it's your friend. So I had to learn that difficulty has a purpose in my life. It's not going to make me bitter. It's going to make me better. It's not going to make me weak. It's going to make me strong. It's not an evidence that God doesn't love me. It's an evidence that a holy God loves me so much. He's not going to leave me the way I am. He wants to continue to develop me so that I bear in my body, my life, and my conversation and character the very likeness of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, they say confession is good for the soul. So I want to confess something to you. I'm not at home, and I, I'll go ahead and confess it to you. In my very first church, I went there with a delusion that in a church everybody's happy. And that lasted five days. I didn't even make it to the next Sunday. I realized that, that wasn't going to happen. There was one man in particular that uh, he's sort of been an aggravation to former pastors and 
And uh, we had to just ease around him, just had to coddle him, just everybody tense in the deacon's meeting, you know, hoping he didn't get mad. And, you know, all, all, I mean, just, could, just, just couldn't see positive in anything. And I got to thinking one day, I got so aggravated. I was young, immature. Now, what? you don't have to rebuke me. I'm going to rebuke myself. I was wrong to do this. But I'm going to tell you what I did. I prayed one day, and I said, God, would you kill him? Just kill him. <laughs> I said, we believe in eternal security in this church. Once saved, always saved. He says he's saved. He can go to heaven. And I believe you could deal with him better than I can deal with him, Lord. And He's the only one in this church that's not happy, so if we get rid of him, God, we're, we're good to go. And then all of a sudden, this sweet lady would die over here, and I'd say, now, Lord, your aim's off. I didn't say kill her. I said to kill that guy sitting right over there. Do you know what I found out in my Christian life? I actually need difficult people in my life because difficult people remind me that I'm not a big shot, and they remind me there's only one star, and his name is Jesus. And they keep me on my knees, and they uh, will knock the pride right out of you. So I'm just saying we need to recover this truth that pressure is not something that we run from. It's not something that overcomes us. It's something that causes us to expand in our Christian life and to become more like Jesus. I'll tell you another truth we need to recover. We're going to produce dynamic Christians. We need to recover the truth of the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Not, not, not Jesus is, is just Savior, but He's Savior and Lord. 24 times in the New Testament it says Jesus is Savior. 644 times it says Jesus Christ is Lord. He speaks in that verse, verse 9, of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Caesar was not His king. Jesus Christ was His king. Jesus Christ didn't save you to simply get you out of hell. He also saved you that through the power of His indwelling Holy Spirit, He could get hell out of you. He wants, the Lord Jesus Christ wants to be in the driver's seat. You know, I was, my wife was in a department store one time shopping, and I was sitting out in the automobile, and uh, I was just waiting for her to come back, and I was watching a liquor store across the street. That's what Baptist preachers do when we're near liquor stores. We watch them. We see if we recognize anybody going in, see if we recognize anybody going out. I was looking for one man in particular. I saw him drive up there. He had a bumper sticker on his back bumper. It said, God is my co-pilot. I said, what a terrible testimony. And then the Spirit of God seemed to speak to me and said, that's his problem. God's his co-pilot. If God had been his pilot, he'd have never pulled in there to begin with. Do you understand that God doesn't want to be your co-pilot? He doesn't want a place in your life. He wants first place in your life. And I, I want you to know the day, listen to me, that you bring your finances, your future, your dreams, your failures, your family, the day you bring them all and you put them under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know, my friend, that's the day you're going to get free because the reason you're a nervous wreck is you're trying to solve all the problems and control everything around you, and you need to put everything in the hands of Jesus Christ, and you need to leave them there. Tell you something else. We need to recover the truth that in the eyes of God, success is faithfulness. Success is faithfulness. Now, John says that he's on the Isle of Patmos. That's not Hawaii, that's not the Bahamas, it's a rock quarry off of modern-day Turkey, off of ancient Asia Minor, where the Romans would exile their political prisoners, having stripped them of their family and finances to just die alone out there in misery. And he says he is on the Isle of Patmos, not because he's out of the will of God, but because he's in the will of God. Not, not because of sin in his life, but because he's simply been faithful. You see, in the eyes of God, success is you doing what God's called you to do exactly where God's called you to do it. I tell my pastor friends that I preach to in conferences, I say, in the eyes of God, there's no, there's no big preachers in small churches. There's just preachers in churches. And whether you're in a mega church or whether you're in a mini church, one of these days we get to an age where they think we're too old, they show us the door, and we're all going to end up in the same place fighting over the same interim pastorates, man. That's our destiny. So we might as well relax because there's not a preacher so famous on planet Earth with a church so big that will someday 
day die and walk through a gate of pearl and cause a stir and see Moses step out from the crowd and say, Brother so-and-so, would you sign my Bible? We thought you'd never get here. That's not going to happen. Listen to me. There's only one star in heaven, and his name is Jesus Christ. And there's only one star in this place, and that's the bright and morning star. It's Jesus Christ. It's not about the preacher. It's not about a man. It's not about a celebrity. It's about a Savior that came and died on an old rugged cross and shed his blood to pay our sin debt. It's all about him, and it's not about us. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to spit on you guys down there. Art. Forgive me. It's like SeaWorld. You sit on the front row, that's a splash zone. Produces a dynamic Christian. Tell you something else. The church God attends gathers on a special day. Gathers on a special day. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, we call it the Lord's Supper because it's a supper that's uniquely His. And the Bible says there's a day that's uniquely His. Uh, the Bible says it was given a name. The Lord said, he says, on this island, I was in the Spirit worshiping on the Lord's day. And that's when the church is supposed to gather. So we need to review what day that is. Did you know for centuries, the church, the people of God, the Old Testament, nation of Israel, they worship God on the last day of the week, Saturday, the Sabbath. For centuries and in one week's time they changed the day of worship from Saturday to what we call Sunday something amazing must have happened on that day you say well brother Herb why do you say it's amazing I've, I've been I'm, I'm gonna be 61 in a few weeks I've been full-time pastor of a Baptist church since I was 23 years old all kinds of them and I'm telling you church folks don't like change I mean, you change the time. and Oh, my goodness, you have to hear about that. Who ever heard of having Sunday school at 9.30, man? We've had Sunday school at 9.15 for years. <laughs> and you know, I was talking about that change in classrooms. I don't mean to get off on the wrong nerve. But I mean, here's a sweet group of little ladies. I mean, they're just so kind. Pastor, you on a pie. Pastor, I, 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 here's a quilt for your, for your new baby. Pastor, we love you. And... And, 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 and then, you know, there's, there's only four of them, and, and they can seat 50 in that room. And we've got a, a, a budding couples class down here that, you know, we're just gonna, they're still going to have room. They're just going down the hall. And I go to these sweet ladies, and I say, we're just going to ask you if you would, could you just move your class down there? The next thing I know, they barricaded themselves with a devil barrel shotgun in there, and I can hear them in there singing. They're, what's that they're singing? We shall, we shall, we shall not be moved. Man, I know. You say, well, I don't know who pulled your chain, but I want you to know, Brother Herb, I made the cushions on those chairs that are in our Sunday school room. <laughs> hey, honey, let me tell you what your pastor won't. Strap them on and take them down to the new room. <laughs> Be flexible. Hey, in one, one week's time, they changed the whole day of worship. So I got to thinking, what was it that happened on the first day of the week? Oh, I remember. I remember. Remember, Jesus died on the cross, buried in a borrowed tomb. And he lay in that tomb. It seemed that death had won the day, didn't it? Did you ever wonder what his folks, that he had healed and touched what they were doing after he died on that cross? I wonder, I wonder if the blind man kept looking at the sunset saying to his wife, Honey, I probably won't see another sunset. My healer's in the grave. I wonder I wonder if that paralytic was running laps around the town square. I probably won't be able to do this again. My healer is in the grave. I probably won't be able to get out of bed. I wonder if the leper was saying, Won't you come hug me? Probably won't hug me in the morning. My healer's in the grave. I wonder if Mary Magdalene was thinking, I wonder if them seven demons are going to come back. He cast them out of me. All those things happening, all those thoughts, all that gloom, People so sad look like average church folks when they're going to church on Sunday morning, dragging their bodies in there, you know. Bless me if you can. 
scared to death somebody's going to enjoy their salvation, you know. All the folks got the gift of criticism. They think it's a spiritual gift. They all ready to exercise it. I've always found there are two kinds of pastors that people love, the one they used to have or the one they're going to get. You know what I mean? <laughs> Early in the morning on the first day of the week, those sweet ladies are walking to that tomb to pay their respects to Jesus. It's on the first day of the week that would be called the Lord's Day and when they got there the stone had been rolled away an angel gave them the good news that the grave could not hold him that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead he kicked the back door out of death turned it into a hallway so if we're absent from our body we're present with the Lord the Bible says the, the, the good news was Jesus Christ is not in this tomb. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. They'll never crucify him again. So the Lord's Day Sunday every week is a celebration of the fact that the grave is empty. Jesus Christ is alive. Well, you had great music every once in a while. I go to a church, got dead music, dead, oh my goodness. Poor old choir, they walk in there, got them old faded choir robes on, smell like mothballs. Pale people, look like they need a good worming, you know what I mean? I mean, pale. <laughs> they, they walk in there and sing, and they begin to sing. It's so sad and depressing. The Lord is in His holy... And this is, to me, unusual. They always, in sync, Temple. I want to just say, time out. Let me help you folks out. God's still in his holy temple because he's not coming to this dead church. Let me tell you right now, he's not coming. Folks, do you understand that the day of Pentecost was on the first day of the week? Do you understand that the church was born in a prayer meeting of a rushing mighty wind and a burning fire? So I'm just saying that the church should not be dead as 4 o'clock on a government job, that worship is not us sitting on our hands acting like our best friend is at his funeral. I want you to know that when we come to God's house on God's day, we ought to be primed, we ought to be expectant, we ought to come to worship. We shouldn't be allergic to praise afraid of worship because I have made up my mind I'm going to be as excited about the fact that Jesus Christ is alive and coming again as people are on a Friday night over a bunch of guys pushing an oblong ball up down a cow pasture. I'm going to be excited about the fact that he lives, he lives, he lives. Well, the church God attends gathers on a special day. Church God attends produces a dynamic Christian. The church God attends also worships a living Savior. Worships a living Savior. You know, when the Lord saved me, I just want to tell you, all, nearly all my life, uh, church folks sometimes try to quench my spirit, calm me down, cool me off. And I'm going to tell you, I made it my mind a long time ago. I don't care how old I am, brother. I'm going to enjoy the trip. I'm going to be excited about Jesus. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. As the old tongue-tied preacher said, it gets gooder and gooder and sweeter and sweeter. I mean, it really does. Man, let, let me explain something to you, folks. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I'm, I was going to hell, but now I'm going to heaven. I, let me just explain to you why I can be happy even though I may have had what some call a bad day because when I think about the fact that he chose me, I didn't go looking for him, he came looking for me. When I think about the fact that I'm accepted in the beloved, not on the basis of my weight or my looks or my IQ or my bank account, but the shed blood of Jesus Christ. When I think about the fact that I'm born as a new babe, a new creation, but adopted as an adult son with a grand inheritance that I've been ransomed, I've been redeemed, I've been forgiven, I'm seated in the heavenlies, I've been brought nigh to God by the blood of Jesus, I have been justified, I'm being sanctified, I'm going to be glorified, i got heaven on the way to heaven, I've got something to be happy about this morning and every day of my life. 
Brother, I'm going to worship. Oh, look, he hears a voice speaking, and it's the voice of Jesus. The Bible says he turned to see the voice that spoke with him, and having turned, he saw seven golden lampstands. Those picture the church, and Jesus is right there in the midst of him. He's in the middle of his church. And the Bible says he saw one like the Son of Man. It was Christ. It says he was clothed with a garment down to his feet. That's the clothing and garb of a priest. Jesus is our great high priest who ever liveth to make intercession for us. It says he was girded about the chest with a golden band. That speaks of deity. It says his head and hair were white like wool. That speaks of his agelessness, his wisdom, and his purity. His eyes were like a flame of fire. That speaks of his omniscience. The Bible says his feet were like fine brass. You remember the first time he came, they nailed those feet to the cross? But the next time he comes, folks, he's coming with feet of brass, bronze. That represents judgment. Remember the first time he came on that mission of mercy, they took those feet and they run that Roman spike through them and they hung him there in agony and shame. But after the great the rapture and the tribulation, when Christ comes back on that war horse, I want you to know when he lands on the Mount of Olives and he dismounts because he's got a foot of brass, when that foot touches the ground, it's going to split it half in two. He's going to walk across the Kedron Valley, ascend to the top of the Temple Mount. He is going to sit on the throne of David and every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says they heard his voice and it sounded like many waters and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth, two-edged sword. God's people, God's ministers, God's people are in his hand. And the Bible says that this man, when he heard that voice and he saw that sight, all he could do was just fall down in worship. We worship a living Savior, and God inhabits the praise of his people. And where there is praise, there is a sense of the manifested presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, let me tell you why I need to be a part of a church where God attends, where God's in the big middle of it. Because when I go to church, I don't, uh, I don't need to be entertained. And when I go to church, I don't know, I don't need a gimmick or a fad. I tell you, first of all, when I go to the church, I need the Word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. And our flesh is restrained by the Word and the devil is repelled by the Word. Our hearts are warmed by the Word. We're kept from sinning by the Word. We find comfort and hope in the Word. I grow. We are sanctified by the washing of the Word. I need the Word of God. Sometimes I need to be corrected. I need God to jerk a knot in me because... I got sin in my life, and I need my attitude to be adjusted. I don't need to hear what I want to hear. I need to hear what I need to hear. And then sometimes I need encouragement. The Bible says that the Lord spoke to him and said, Don't be afraid. And I'm telling you, friend, there are times when you've had things in your life that strike fear in you and you need to go to God's house and for God to show up and for God to speak to your heart and say, Fret not, do not be afraid i got everything under control. But sometimes, now listen, I need the touch of revival. You get weary in the work. You remember when that lady touched the hem of Jesus' garment and he felt something go out of him? That was his healing power. But there's also another principle there. When you minister the life of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, it takes something out of you. You give of your very self. You get weary. The Bible says, the Word of God teaches us very clearly here, that when she reached out, he felt something go out of him. And there are just times when you get tired and you need a revival. The Bible says that the Lord reached down there and touched John. And there are just times, are you hearing this? There are times when I need to go to a worship service, when I need to go to the church that I'm attached to. I need to walk in that place. I need to open my heart. And I need the unseen hand of Jesus to reach down and touch. Touch me and shake me and stir me and fire me up to get back there on the firing line. I need a touch of revival. You know, there was a famous Christian in Scotland named W.P. McKay. Dr. McKay was a famous doctor. He grew up in a Christian home. His mom was a godly woman. She raised him in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
But he was a rebel as a teenager, and the more she talked to him about Jesus, the harder his heart got. Till finally, when he graduated from high school, he was a near atheist. He, he, she gave him a Bible, having written him a little note in the flyleaf as he left home to go to school. The first thing he did was sell that Bible to get a little change. When he got away, having sold that Bible, he finished college, went to medical school, became a famous doctor, and one day he was in the emergency room supervising, and they brought in what they called a day laborer. He had fallen off some scaffolding, and he was all busted up inside, and Dr. McKay said, I, I'm going to be honest with you, sir. I cannot... I can't save your life. All I can do is ease the pain. And it didn't bother the man, which kind of bothered Dr. McKay. He said, he, he said with a twinkle in his eye, well, that's okay. Just have my landlady come by from the boarding house. He said, don't you have family? He said, no, I don't have any family at all. He said, just tell the landlady to come by. And when she comes by, I want to make sure I've paid my bill and tell her to bring the book. He said, what book? He said, you just tell her to bring the book. She knows what I'm talking about. He lingered a few days. The twinkle in his eye, tremendous pain, never complained. You see, he was a believer. He was saved. He knew he'd be absent from his body and present with the Lord. And when he died, Dr. McKay went in to supervise the taking possession of his effects, personal effects. They were boxing it up. A nurse was boxing it up. And all of a sudden, she held up something. She said, what do you want me to do with this? He said, what's that? She said, that's the book he was talking about. It was his Bible. His landlady brought it on the second visit. He said, let me see that Bible. And he opened up that Bible. And to his shock and dismay, in the flyleaf of that Bible was his mother's handwriting. That's that Bible that she gave him when he graduated from high school that he sold. And that Bible had tracked him down. And he said, this is not a coincidence. And he got saved. And later he wrote these words that we need to make a prayer today. He wrote these words. They're in our hymnal to this day. He wrote, revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us. Revive you. Revive me. Revive us again. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Before we leave this conference, if you've never been saved, if you're not sure if you died today that you go to heaven, you say, Brother Herb, I'm just not sure. I want you to know sitting right there, you can, you believe Christ died for you and shed his blood to pay your sin debt, was buried and Raised from the dead, if you'll open your heart. You don't have to say it out loud. He reads minds and hearts. Say, Lord, come into my heart and save my soul. Forgive me of all my sins. Save my soul, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Just cry out. Whosoever will cry out like that, Jesus says, I'll save them. I want to encourage you to do that. Now I want to pray for everybody else. I want to pray for everybody else here that just needs a, just needs a touch of revival. You just need a touch from God. You just need a fresh touch from above. Holy Spirit of the living God, reach down in this place today and give us a fresh touch, body, soul, and spirit. Oh, Lord, set our soul afire, Lord. Set our soul afire. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. God bless you, and thank you for allowing me to be with you this morning. <laughs>